Good morning, church family, and happy Easter. I'm Vince, and I'm so excited that we're together today. I don't know about you, but I would have never dreamed we'd be sharing Easter Sunday anywhere other than the sanctuary at First Baptist. What a unique opportunity we have to celebrate this morning with our family and loved ones around New Braunfels and beyond. For my family and I, Easter Sunday usually looks like church service followed by a get-together at the house that is full of great food, cascarones in the driveway, and a ton of fun. And while that might have changed this year, there's one thing that hasn't changed, the reason we celebrate, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, Pastor Brad will teach from Isaiah 53, which speaks of the cross of Jesus and shows us why the cross matters and how Jesus demonstrates his love for you. Maybe you need to pray with someone today. After the message, I'll share with you a number to call. Our desire is to help you the best we can and bring honor to the Lord. And you can always reach us by email at the address below. We want you to join with us as we open our hearts and minds to what God has for us today. But before we continue, let me pray as we enter into this time. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship with our family and friends this morning. Even though we are apart, we are together in our worship of you. I know that things look different and there can be distractions today. There can be worry and fear and just preoccupation with things that will draw our attention away. But this morning, I ask for a time of focused worship that you would meet with us, help us to know you better. And I pray that if there's someone who's watching this morning, God, they might put their faith in you. They might realize how much you love them, that you would send your son to live, to die, and to rise again on the third day. So as Pastor Brad brings the message, I pray you give him clarity of thought, that every word he says would be from you for us to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before Pastor Brad leads us in the opening of God's word, let's join together in worship. This can be the best and most powerful hour of the week as we praise and worship the Lord through song. One day when heaven was filled with his praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he The word became flesh and the light shined among us His glory revealed Living He loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and Rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried, He carried my sins far. Yeah. 
could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day sins far away rising he justified freely forever Christ 
the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll Hi, good morning. I want to welcome you to uh, worship online with First Baptist Church, New Braunfels. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us. Uh, as you can see, we are outside. And so uh, there's going to be noises. There are going to be some cars going by. There may be an airplane flying over. But if you're not distracted, I'm going to try really not to be distracted during that time. So let's just focus together as we worship. We're taking our Bibles. We are turning together to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and we're going to stand as we read God's word together beginning in verse 1. God's word says this, who has believed what we have heard and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He did not have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we did not value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him as stricken by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punishment, punished him for the iniquity of us all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you will use your eternal word to pierce deeply into our heart. Father, may you give us understanding of your word and may we respond rightly to you in these moments. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we gather for worship this morning, we celebrate this eternal truth that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And so we celebrate that this morning. Indeed, as we gather for worship every Sunday morning, that is a truth we celebrate. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. You know, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus uh, that we are able to claim victory over death. Uh, it is because of the resurrection of Jesus that we are able to look forward to eternal life with Him because of what He has done and what He has done in and through our lives. It is because of the resurrection of Jesus that we are able to fully commit our lives to Him, not worrying whether we live or whether we die, because we are secure in the Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says this, For if we have been united with Him in the likeness of His death, we will certainly be with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. You know, the promise of Scripture because of the resurrection is that we will be like Jesus. Ultimately, as we enter into eternity, we will be like our Lord. The Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, the Scripture goes on to say, also heirs, 
heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. And so the resurrection of Jesus is this wonderful promise that is given to those who have trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life for the forgiveness of their sin. But friend, as we think about the resurrection of Christ and all of that means, we cannot get to the resurrection without the crucifixion. We cannot celebrate a risen Savior without a crucified Savior. You know, the event of the crucifixion is, is much less comforting to us, especially in our culture today. Um, uh, it is a reminder that somewhere between the triumphal entry and the resurrection of Jesus as the Messiah of God, we have this uh, incredible event called the crucifixion uh, that uh, is, is heart-wrenching as we think about what our Lord went through in those very moments. But remember, we cannot celebrate a resurrection without the crucifixion. You know, theologically, as we, as we think about, uh, as we think about the, the crucifixion of Christ, oft, oftentimes we think that it is um, Jesus was murdered, uh, that Jesus was executed. But theologically, in that understanding, the cross is not an execution of Jesus. For the Romans, that's what it was. For the Jews, that's what it was. They were ridding themselves of some religious ruler that spoke against them. They were ridding themselves of someone who claimed to be a king uh, who was not Caesar himself. But the spiritual impact, the spiritual impact of the crucifixion is much different. You see, theologically, the cross is a substitution. The cross is a substitution. The substitution of Jesus dying in our place. Him sacrificing His life for me. You see, theologically, biblically, Jesus took my place on the cross. Jesus suffered the punishment for my sin on the cross. Isaiah 53 puts the cross in very vivid terms. This is a beautiful prophecy about uh, the suffering servant who ultimately uh, was Jesus. Uh, it puts the, the cross in very vivid terms, terms that, terms that are uncomfortable, terms that draw out of us a deep emotion, terms though that are necessary for us to understand how the cross impacts our life every day. Now, as we think about these words, we think about this prophecy from Isaiah. As, as we look at Jesus with a physical eye, the scripture says it must have been disappointing to look at him with a physical eye, but it should not have been. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would not be the conquering hero that everyone expected. Uh, he would not come in a form of, of majesty and, and glory. His earthly father, the Gospels tell us, was a carpenter. And Jesus, too, was a carpenter. He grew up in, in Galilee. That's not even in Jerusalem. It's north of Jerusalem. He grew up in the region of, of Galilee. And according to Scripture, his form was not impressive. There was not much to look at when someone looked upon the physical form of Christ. But you see, I have every confidence that God planned it this way. I have every confidence that this was the Lord's design. You see, our natural inclination is to be drawn to that which is physically appealing. We, we enjoy looking on things that are physically appealing, but as we know from God's Word, God works in a very different way than how we work. He thinks differently than than we think. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And in verse 2, as we read there that he had no stately form or he had no impressive form, in verse 2, the word desire there means to desire something or to covet something, to want something. And so it makes perfect sense that the anticipated Messiah, he, well, he would have no earthly majesty. 
there would not be a form that people would be naturally drawn to. This speaks, you know, with a very basic nature of people being attracted to those things that are physically appealing. Now, why would the Messiah of God, the very representation of God in this world, not be physically appealing or have a form of majesty? Well, you know this truth, that beauty is fleeting. The physical form changes over its, its lifetime. God planned it that way so that we might be drawn uh, to the real beauty of who Jesus is, that we might be drawn uh, to the holiness of Christ, that we might be drawn to the mercy of Jesus, to the love of Jesus, to the compassion of our Lord. God planned it that way, that men would be drawn to the courage of Jesus, the confidence of Christ as he uh, repeated the very word of God, as he stood uh, for the holiness of God, that we might be drawn to those things, not his physical form. You know, no believer in, in our day can claim to have seen the physical Christ or Christ in his incarnation. But we can claim this. We can say that we have seen the heart of Jesus, that we've sensed the heart of Christ. We've, we've experienced the love of Jesus, the comfort, the compassion of our Lord. Those things that we are drawn to because that is who Jesus is. And those are the things that draw us to Christ, that God puts forward in and through Christ that draw us to him. That, know, that we know that He is Lord, He is our Savior. Scripture says He had no physical beauty or majesty, but the things that really matter, Christ had, and He demonstrates those things, even today in and through our lives. These things were present in the cross of Christ, and that's why we see such beauty in the cross. Because everything that God has poured out through His Son is being displayed right in and through the cross of Christ. Now, what was also present in the cross of Christ is the love of Jesus that He has for you and that He has for me. Now, no doubt, no doubt the cross was a gruesome event. It was gruesome both in the physical realm as he was flogged, as his skin was ripped open and his flesh was exposed. But it was gruesome spiritually as well. But friend, overshadowing all of those things is this incredible love that Jesus is demonstrating in those moments for you and for me. You know, we... We teach a simple song to children, don't we? we? We teach the song and it's sung like this. It goes like this. It's, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible. Well, the Bible tells me so. You know, the Bible does tell you so. The Bible does say that the Lord Jesus loves you. The Bible clearly tells us that he loves you and he loves me. And beginning in verse four, we read of that love, that prophesied love of Christ that is demonstrated in and through the cross. Scripture reads this way, Isaiah prophesied, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. Now, our sicknesses um, uh, uh, do not speak of uh, sickness or disease as we might know it in the physical realm. Jesus is not functioning here in the role of the great physician. Now, we, we like to see Jesus as the great physician. He has complete authority and control over our bodies. He is able to heal disease, to heal sickness within our physical body, but he's not operating as the great physician here in this prophecy. He's not taking that sickness upon his shoulders because our disease here, it's not a physical ailment. Our disease here is spiritual. Our disease is the sickness of sin in which we all are afflicted. Every soul runs rampant with this all-encompassing disease called sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, uh, sin is called this. It's, it's called something that so easily entangles. 
it so easily wraps us up. That word there entangles uh, means to skillfully surround us. And so each of us is skillfully surrounded by sin. And we are afflicted with that because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve to God right there in the Garden of Eden. You know, sin, as we think about it, well, it really is a disease that, that strikes with precision and it strikes with great purpose in our lives. In the human soul, we are helpless uh, to the attacks of sin in our life. But there is a Savior, Isaiah prophesies, who was coming and who did come. There is a Savior who has borne that disease for us, who has lifted that disease from our very soul. Jesus has lifted that disease of sin uh, from the soul of man. All of those who call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, who call on him for the forgiveness of their sin. Scripture says that through the love of Christ, through the cross of Christ, that he's born that disease. He has born that sickness in himself. Scripture goes further here. Scripture says that Jesus has carried our sorrows. Sorrows uh, is translated the word pain. You know what pain is. You know what physical pain is. You know what emotional pain is as well. We also know the result of pain regard, uh, as a result of our sin. So scripture says because Jesus loves us, he has borne that pain of our sin. You know, there's a lasting hurt that comes with sin. Sometimes that is felt in the physical body. Uh, the choices that we've made, the uh, sin that we've engaged in our life, there's a physical result from that, but there's always, there's always a spiritual pain that comes with that as well. There's a, an emotional pain that comes with our sin. And as Jesus demonstrates his love through the cross, he has intervened to lift that pain, to carry that burden of sin. In essence here, Jesus lifts that pain of sin so that we might know the forgiveness of God, so that we might experience the healing of God the Father over our lives as a result of the sin that we have committed against Him. What incredible love Jesus shows us through the cross, that He would come, that He would die in our place, that he would lift that burden so that we might know the forgiveness of God as a result of our sin. You know, sin does sting and, and sin should sting our lives. We, we should feel that pain when we uh, knowingly choose to be disobedient to the Father. But oh, the love of Jesus, isn't it a healing balm? Don't you rejoice in the Father knowing that your sin is forgiven in and through Him? You know, just last night I was on, my wife and I, we were on with our small group, and we were reminded that as the people in the day of, of Nehemiah, as they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, rebuilt the wall there, they came together and they listened to the word of God, they heard the word of God, and then they responded to the word of God in repentance. And as they responded to the word of God in repentance, that drew out of them the praise given to the Father. Boy, what a beautiful, what a beautiful expression of knowing that God has lifted the pain of sin through the love of Christ demonstrated on the cross and allows us to rejoice in God the Father and worship and give praise to Him. Now, initially here though, the writer confesses as we continue to work through Isaiah chapter 53, the writer confesses that we would not see Jesus rightly. He would not be understood rightly because of his physical form. The thought that Jesus uh, would receive his just reward is kind of lying underneath the surface here. The testimony of Scripture is the, is the cross was, was not a reward at all. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have 
a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in every way as we are, yet, Scripture says, without sin. So he did not violate the righteousness and holiness of God the Father. And so we see once again, the cross is not about an execution. It's not about ridding some religious upstart who is causing a problem to the religious establishment. It's not getting rid of a problem. But it's Jesus taking our place. Him standing in our place for the punishment of our sin. Removing that pain of sin. And doing so, Isaiah writes, Jesus was pierced through for our transgressions. Now, if there's a hint of misunderstanding at the end of verse 4 there that Jesus got what he deserved, well, it's quickly cleared up in verse 5. And so there's a decisive contrast here between the end of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5. Jesus did not get what he deserved. Verse 5 says this, He was pierced through for our rebellion. He suffered for our sin, not his own. The piercing of Christ came in the form of spikes that were driven through his wrist and were driven through his feet. He was wounded and hung on that cross because of our rebellion against God, our need to have our sin removed from our soul. And only Jesus could do that through the shedding of his blood. And so we see so clearly the cross is not an execution. The cross is a substitution. Jesus standing in our place, taking the punishment for the burden of our sin. God's Word goes on to say there that He was crushed because of our iniquities. In other words, Jesus was shattered because of our rebellion and because of our perversity. Our desperate need to be made, made right with a holy and righteous God. The word well-being here speaks to completeness, speaks of being sound, it speaks of welfare, it speaks of peace. People everywhere, especially in this day, people everywhere are looking for peace. They're looking to be uh, uh, made well, they're looking to have their welfare looked after, they're looking for security in these days of uncertainty. Well-being. Well-being cannot be found outside of the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. And we find that in one place. We find that on the cross of Christ. You know, there are grotesque pictures in, in Scripture of people who are trying to find what only Jesus can give. They're seeking to be have peace with God. They're doing everything they can in order to be made right with God, but it's only found in one place. It's found in the cross of Christ. If we look further back in the Old Testament, we go back to 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and, and we, we see so clearly there um, uh, the ends to which people will go in order uh, uh, to be made right with God. We read of people sacrificing their children on the altars of false gods. And we have to understand there the depravity of the human soul, the very perversion of the human soul to, to kill what God has made only to please what man has created. Did you hear that? The depravity and the links with which humanity will go to kill what God has created, only to please what man has created. But Isaiah wrote this. Isaiah wrote that Jesus was wounded with blows. He was wounded with whips, 
punches from fists, and his spikes were driven through his flesh so that we might be healed of this disease called sin. So that we might know the relief from the pain of sin in our very soul. Oh friend, the cross is not an execution. The cross is a glorious substitution. Jesus standing in your place so that your sin might be forgiven. Now why do we why do we need the substitution of Jesus? Verse 6 gives us a clear uh, picture of our need. <laughs> notice Notice that in verse 6, we are described as, as sheep. <laughs> sheep. I, I don't know if you know much about sheep, but they are not a very intelligent animal. Uh, they are in desperate need of great care uh, because they cannot seem to care for themselves. Uh, they are easily distracted. They are utterly helpless to care for themselves. So sheep need a shepherd. They need someone watching over them uh, every day of their lives. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 9, Scripture tells us this. It says, Jesus was going all through all of the, the cities and the villages. Uh, he, he was teaching in their synagogues, and he was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom there. And he was, he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, those physical things. Seeing the people, uh, Scripture says, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So we are, we are helpless sheep, the Bible says. We are determined to wander away from our shepherd. Friend, turning to your own way means you're turning away from God. Turning to your own way means that you're turning away from Christ, the shepherd of our soul, the shepherd who keeps us safe, the shepherd who gives us guidance in life, the shepherd who lifts the burden of sin in our lives. And so uh, instead of allowing the eternal consequences for our sin to condemn our life, this is what God has done. This is the love that God has shown us. Through the cross, he's allowed the consequences of sin to fall on the shepherd. The shepherd, Jesus, has taken the burden and paid the burden for our sin. This is the imagery here of the Old Testament sacrificial system uh, that God developed through hundreds of years, a system established by God that required the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And we see that beautiful picture that took place uh, during the Passover every single year. Well, Jesus has become that Passover lamb, the one whose blood was shed so that your sin and my sin might be forgiven by the Lord. So we see this beautiful picture unfolding and so you see, the cross is not an execution. The cross is a substitution. Jesus standing in our place for the forgiveness of our sin. And friend, I, I want to remind you of this, that the work of the cross is finished. The work of the cross is it's finished. When Scripture says that we are healed by the wounds of Jesus, we are healed. Our sin is forgiven by God through Christ for all of those who call on the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin. You know, while, while on the cross, as uh, uh, we think about Jesus hanging there, John chapter 19 says this, that while hanging on the cross, Jesus made this statement. He said, it is finished. It is finished. Now, we're sure to note here that Jesus was not, was not executed. His life was not taken from him. Jesus gave his life. Jesus laid down his life so that we might have life through him. And because Jesus is risen, we are able to have eternal life in and through Jesus and Jesus alone. 
We think about that, that word finish, that, that verb finish, it's in the perfect tense, which means this. It means that an action has taken place and it has permanent results. It is finished. And the results are permanent. So for all of those who call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, your sin is forgiven. You have peace with God. And that is a finished work. And it comes only through the cross of Christ. Now, as we uh, conclude our, our time together, as we think about the conclusion of the Passion Week, let us be reminded here of the cross of Jesus. Let us be reminded here of the resurrection of, of Jesus, that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is alive. Let us be reminded here that we have eternal life in one place. We have eternal life in and only through the risen Savior who gave himself as a substitute for you. All this wonderful news that our Lord was not executed, but our Lord willingly laid down his life so that we might have life in him, spiritual life in him. Oh, we have such good news to celebrate today, that Jesus is risen, that he is Lord, and he and he alone bring salvation to the soul of diseased people because our soul is sin-filled. But through the work of the cross, we can know the healing of the pain of sin. We can have peace with God through Jesus and Jesus alone. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we thank you for this day, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate our, our risen Savior. We thank you, Father, that you have shown your love to us by allowing your very Son to suffer and die upon a Roman cross so that our sin might be forgiven through his shed blood. Father, for this, we praise you and we exalt and lift high the name of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now friend, if, if you are listening today and you are, you are unsure if your sin has been forgiven, you are unsure that you know uh, God the Father and you are at peace with God the Father through uh, Jesus the Son, if you are unsure about those things, I want to encourage you to call the number that's uh, down at the bottom of the screen. I want you uh, to call today. There will be someone to take your call and there will be folks who are, be, who are ready and willing uh, to talk with you about a relationship with Jesus Christ through calling on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and to know that your sin is forgiven. Maybe you just would like someone to pray with you today. Call that number. There are folks that are waiting for you, willing to pray with you this very moment. So as we continue in these uncertain days, I want you to be certain of this. I want you to be certain that through Jesus Christ, you may know the forgiveness of your sin and you may know with certainty your hope for eternity and that you will spend eternity with Jesus in the heaven that he is preparing for you even today. Thank you, Pastor Brad, for opening God's word for us. I'm so thankful for what Jesus has done for me and we wanna share him with you. As I mentioned earlier, if you need to talk with someone today, please call the number on the screen. We wanna help and somebody is ready to visit with you right now. Thank you for your tithes and offerings or any donations. There are three convenient ways for you to give. You can text the word GIVE to the number on the screen. You can give securely online at fbcnb.org, or you can mail a check to the address below. Don't worry if you miss what was on the screen. All the information for donations will be listed in the description section below. Remember, a personal invitation is still the most likely way to get our friends to be guests with us in church. Invite someone to join us next week for church, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Let's continue to make today a very special Easter, and have a great day.